What's the scariest 100% true story you've heard of? One of my friend's family growing up had a beach house and I'd get invited every now and then. They had dollar and the house was massive. Pretty cool place too. They even had a full-time maid who had her own flat at the back. One day they go there for a long weekend and when they opened the door, the place had been ransacked. It was all a mess. Missing TVs, furniture, broken stuff. You get the picture. They went to check on the maid and her flat was empty. All her belongings were gone. They called the cops who came over and had a brief look. Not interested from what they said. And left saying the maid probably had something to do with. And that's what everyone believed for week. Until the dad returned the following weekend to try and change the locks and etc. And he brought their dogs along with him. Yep. You know it. One of the dogs started digging and found the maid buried in the backyard under a tarp they had close to the pool. So the theory now is that whoever came in probably knew her and she recognized them and she had to go. The story of the Lake Nyos disaster. The lake periodically belches a cloud of invisible carbon dioxide gas that suffocates everything within a 16 mile radius. In 1986, over 1,700 people and all their livestock died without even understanding what was happening to them. When I was learning to drive, my instructor advised me to always lock my car doors. As soon as I get into my car, I asked her why and she told me her personal experience. This happened almost a year after she passed her test she finished work about 3 a.m. She just gotten into her car and gotten her keys in the ignition. When three guys jumped into her car, she had a knife to her neck and was told to drive. They give her directions to an alleyway. They dragged her out of the car and raped her. After they were done with her, they left her in the alleyway and stole her car and purse. It took her a while to get help. Police did find her car a few days later. Abandoned and on fire on the outskirts of the city. But the guys were not caught. The reason she started to teach driving was her way to protect other women and make sure no one else goes through what she went through. So she advised all her female students to lock their car doors as soon as they get in. My high school GF called late one night after I was home and in bed. She said that something had happened and asked if I could come over. She was clearly shaken and not full of details. So I told my parents and drove over towards her house. At the top of her subdivision I was met by a cop with lights on. He asked where I was going and I told him about the call from my GF. He lets me go by and I come over the hill to the cul-de-sac where she lives and I see multiple cop cars around the circle. They watch me pull up and get out of my car. My GF comes running out of her house and meets me in the street. She explains that someone had broken into her neighbor's house and started beating her with something heavy. The neighbor managed to get out of the house and headed to my GF's house where she started banging furiously on the front door. My GF's dad was out of town. So her mom answered the door and the neighbor just fell into the foyer bleeding profusely from the head. Her mom looks up to see the attacker headed up the walkway towards the front door. She pulls the neighbor into the house and closes the door hitting the attacker with it before it fully closed. He then took the heavy tool he had used to beat the neighbor and smashed the little window at the top of the door. Her mom started screaming and the attacker just turned around and walked up the street into the darkness. I spent the night there that night, along with two or three cops outside in their cars. And in the morning we could see blood still pooled on the floor in the foyer and splattered blood above the front door from where the attacker had swung the bloody tool to smash the window. No one was ever caught or even identified. It was just completely random. The neighbor survived and to my knowledge had no permanent physical injuries beyond scarring from having her scalp stapled shut. 
She moved away shortly after the incident. Edit. Update on victim's status and paragraphing. Though probably not correctly. TLDR. GF's neighbor was brutally attacked in her home. She ran to my GF's house and the attacker fled after nearly getting into their house too. No one was ever caught. Well, it's my story. When I was a little kid. 56? We had this neighbor like grandma to me. I'd go over and have snacks. And she had a Mr. Potato Head I played with that was her. Now adult. Son's toy. Weird core memories. He came home. In his 20s. From the army I think. I don't remember much about him. But he asked about taking my older brothers camping. But my mom said no. She had a weird feeling about him. Side note. We lived out in in the country. Not even a town. Just a place. There were no locked doors. Everyone trusted each other. My mom saw him at our little store with bee stings all over and was concerned. He said he got them at the creek. She thought that was weird. Because that's just not a thing where we went all the time. But okay. A little while later. Not sure how long. The news said there was a murder of some campers out past where we lived. No leads. People were shocked this doesn't happen here. My mom remembered her weird feeling and the bee stings that didn't make sense. She called the police to say, Hey, probably nothing, but here's what I got. I remember detectives coming to our house to talk to her. They had some other evidence that matched, but not enough to link him to the murder. A couple with their child. It's unsolved to this day. Though the detective said he knew it was him. A few years later. The guy went to prison for an abduction, attempted murder of a woman who ran out of gas and he. Offered her a ride. She lived. Thank God. One of my parents' neighbors had shingles so bad that he committed suicide. I work midnight shift at a gas station and I have for quite a while at various stations in different areas with varying levels of criminal activity. I have regulars. Of course. I'm a small statured woman. As is my partner the other half of the week. And we've always been partners. So these regulars often worry about us and keep watch on creepy occurrences when they can. I had one man who worked in the metro an hour away who would stop in every morning for his cigarettes. He never smiled or seemed friendly. And as I often do, I tried to think of what I could do that might make him smile one day. It took many months but I finally pulled it off by having his cigarettes ready on the counter and already scanned for him to pay for as he walked in. He smiled and then asked me. Do you ever get scared on the night shift? You small girl. Is not safe. I said I sometimes did but we could lock the doors and hide if we had to. And that the provincial police. Think state troopers. If you're American. Had a station close by and came in often to get their highway vehicles washed. I had a good rapport with those police. He nodded and then told me a story about when he first moved to our country from Eastern Europe with his wife and child back in the late 80s, early 90s. He fell asleep at work one night at the gas station he worked midnights at. When he woke up, the phone had been ringing for hours and his manager was shaking him violently asking if he was. All right, he was fine. He said, what was the problem? He was sorry he fell asleep. His manager screamed that it was fine he fell asleep. To look outside. All of their motor oil was missing and the outside of the place was a mess. The thieves had come and swiped all the oil and left him be because he slept through the entire thing. And then moved down the road to the next station for an encore. At that station, the clerk was awake and fought back. So the thieves stabbed him to death and left him to bleed out. When he finished telling me this, he concluded with, if you ever feel sleepy just lock the door and do it. It might save your life. I don't work at that station anymore but I think about that guy all the time and wonder how his grandkids are. 
Here is a link to an article talking about how that poor other clerk's killers were finally found. 25 years later. HTTPS. Toronto.ctvnews.ca slash mobile slash arrest made in 1990 murder a gas station attendant 1.2650933. I was around 10 years old. I was at school but my mom told me she was thinking of taking me to the doctors in the afternoon. Recurring eye issue. Lunchtime and I'm in the dining hall when the office woman told me there was a taxi outside for me. And I needed to go. I assumed my mom booked it for me as she can't drive. I cleared up my stuff and got my bag. Just about to leave when I remembered my jacket in my classroom. I rush to get and head out for the taxi. Office woman tells me I'm too late and the taxi had gone without me. I just went back to class but panicking my mom would be angry at me. School finishes and my mom is waiting for me at the gates. I burst into tears apologizing for missing the taxi and thinking I was in big trouble. She never ordered a taxi and had no clue what I was talking about. She ended up not making the doctor appointment. No one ever found out who ordered the taxi. Or who driver was. My mom doesn't like to think what would have happened if I hadn't forgotten my jacket and got in that. Taxi. TLDR missed a taxi I thought my mom booked for me. Only to find out it could have been an attempted kidnapping. World War II. The Pacific Theater. My great-uncle on my mother's side fought at Okinawa. While taking cover behind a rock. He was shot through the foot by a Japanese sniper and evacuated to a hospital for recovery. He was the only member of his platoon to make it off the island alive. When I was a freshman in high school. I saw two men get in a fight. And one man put a gun in the other man's mouth and told him to beg for his life which he did. 14-year-old me peed his pants multiple times after that and needed counseling. My grandfather's village was raised by the Nazis. He had nine siblings. The Nazis came to the village in retribution due to guerrilla attacks and they believed the guerrillas were hiding there. Most young men fled before they arrived. The men that were in the village were lined up against a wall and shot. My grandfather's mother put half her children, the youngest, in the cellar and she took the other half with her because the Nazis were rounding up the entire village and locked them inside the church. The reason she had split her children was because she feared they would all be killed. So she wanted at least some of them to survive. The Nazis ransacked and burned nearly every house in the village, including my grandfather's. He was in the cellar with his siblings and their house burned above them. But they were saved. Those in the church also survived but many didn't. After this the Nazis would come again some time after and pretty much force all the young men and boys, including my grandfather, to help make roads and fortifications for them. Despite it all they all survived the war, though many in the family didn't. The Case of the Clutter Family Murders. Told expertly by Truman Capote in his book. In Cold Blood. What really gets me about the case is that all it took was one person knowing the family to make. The connection that ultimately ended their lives. Floyd Wells. A former employee of the father. Told his cellmate about the clutters and that inmate. Richard Hickok. Became convinced the family had a fortune stored in a safe at their house. Upon his release, Hickok contacted another former cellmate, Perry Smith, and they planned to rob the family. There was no safe and no fortune. Instead, the pair left with a small radio, a pair of binoculars, and less than $50 cash, along with the lives of Herb, Bonnie, Kenyon, and Nancy Clutter. A quote from Hickok talking about Herb has especially stuck with me. I thought he was a very nice gentleman. I thought so right up to the moment I cut his throat. My grandfather was a British FEPOW in Japan in WW2. 
He did something to piss off the guards of his camp one evening and they beat him badly and tied him up on a fence with the promise to kill him the next day. Another young prisoner died during the night so they switched my granddad and the dead lad so the guards assumed he'd died from his injuries. Luckily he survived and came home in 1945. So when I was around 18 I went to town to drink something with my friends. We went all in and by 2 am I was completely wasted. Couldn't see. Walk or think straight. One of my mates remained sober to drive us back home. We went to the parking lot and I could hear a voice whimmering somewhere in the dark. I turned around and saw two guys carrying a girl to a car. I got closer and now I could hear her voice. She obviously was drunk but she repeated, no. And, I don't want. Over and over. Adrenaline kicked in and I became sober instantly. I screamed at them and immediately called the police. I wasn't fast enough so they could get in the car and drive off. But I saw the license plate. Gave it to the woman I talked to at the police station and they informed me about 10 minutes later. That they arrested the two guys. The whole scene was so terrifying. This was in Germany. A chimpanzee named Travis attacking his owner's friend. Travis attacked and mauled his owner's friend. Blinding her. Severing several body parts. And lacerating her face. Before he was shot and killed by a cop. The owner called 911 during the attack. Travis's screams can be heard in the background at the start of the tape as the owner pleads for the police. Initially they believed the call to be a hoax until she said. He's eating her. Quote. The murder of Sylvia Likens. It's equal parts heartbreaking and scary. Due to the fact that humans can be so cruel. I'll take posts I shouldn't click on at 2 a.m. for $1,000, Alex. A robbery at my place but the way in which it happened. I lived in a basement suite with my younger brother of a quiet neighborhood. The entire front of the house is exposed to the sidewalk but the sides and the back are covered with fenced and trees. The only way to see if anyone is in the basement is through this small window in my bedroom that's about five feet from my bed. I got word while I was out that my place had been robbed. The robbers went through the basement suite door through the back, kicked it open, then made themselves upstairs after robbing the basement suite. They just so happened to rob the place in a 30-minute window when myself, my brother and the people upstairs were out. This means they were watching us for a couple days and monitoring our patterns. What scared me was not really the robbery, but the image of me sleeping while a robber presses his face against the window five feet from away. From my bed just watching me. Up to this day, I'm still looking for a logical explanation to this. This happened in 2003. So I and an ex were checked in. In a coastal resort where the cottages were far apart. Like 200 meters away. Around 1:11:30 pm while we're both drinking beer with the lights turned off and only the TV on. The doorknob suddenly rattled violently. Like someone was forcibly trying to get it open. There was no double lock on the door so my first reaction was to jump from the bed and block the door with my weight. The force of my landing must have been heard from the other side but the twisting of the doorknob continued. By this time I was already pressing my face to the floor. Trying to look, estimate how many people were outside the door via the small gap between the floor and the bottom of the door. There was nothing. Not one pair of feet or anything. But the doorknob just kept rattling. I should point out that the gap between the floor and the door was enough for me to see the outside. Or at the very least notice any change in shadow, light, caused by movement. But there was nothing. The turning of the doorknob then stopped. But I never heard any footsteps or any other noise. Waited a few minutes and opened the door. Everything was quiet. No footprints outside or on the sand surrounding the cottage. We just noped out of there immediately. 
My mom is from El Salvador. She lived there at the height of the civil war. She told me that one time. The terrorist group in her country found out someone in her town was part of the military. He had twin daughters with extremely long hair. They tied their hair to the trailer hitch of their trucks and proceeded to do donuts in the middle of town and drag them until they both died. They then left their bodies on his front door. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our playlists full of similar content. Epic Aircast is like doom scrolling for your ears. Please like, share, and subscribe.